Thank you, Alberto. While he's looking for my slides, which I hope in there someplace, how many, I'm going to ask the same question Sue Ellen Hopped asked yesterday. How many of you here are meteorologists or atmospheric scientists? All right, a good many of you are. Um, that's, uh, when I first started my career, um, I thought being a meteorologist meant being able to go outside and look at the clouds every day and, and maybe report down what you're seeing and try to predict the weather. And, and in fact, my early days of my career, that's exactly what I did, working for a National Weather Service. And it was really enjoyable, but then as my career progressed, I realized there really are, um, and the, the emphasis of uh, societal uh, needs for our profession really became apparent. And early as my, in my career as an, at a national lab, we became involved in some of the very earliest uh, wind resource characterization programs in the United States. And it became an opportunity to apply our knowledge in the atmospheric sciences to helping uh, the growth of the wind energy industry. And uh, even though in those days the um, industry, or the R&D was mainly uh, supported by NASA and by Boeing and by Westinghouse, which uh, always believed they could build the wind turbines so big and so robust that uh, atmospheric turbulence or issues would not be, ever be a problem for them, they became quickly aware of the importance of the atmospheric sciences uh, in their um, progress and in the development of those technologies. So I'll, I'll try to talk a little bit more about how um, the uh, growing societal needs for our profession in the energy meteorology um, have evolved over the last number of years. Let's see, here's a, there we go. All right. So uh, what I'll do is I'll just give a quick overview. I think I just gave some of that. I'm going to talk about uh, a concept that's really growing in interest and perhaps importance around the world, and that is the idea of perhaps at some point in time in the future, we will have a completely fossil-free energy environment. We'll be uh, powered primarily, almost completely, by 100% renewable energy or clean energy technologies. But there are definitely opportunities and challenges for our profession in that area. And uh, then I'll just give a few takeaway comments. So as I said, uh, the meteorologists in society uh, fundamentally has played a very important role in protecting human health and safety, uh, protecting property, supporting effective commerce, and as we have seen more recently, enhancing energy access for all in a 100% renewable energy world and really providing some uh, important support in that idea. Um, about two, the year 2000, I think, uh, the UN organized a, a number of nations to get together to establish Millennium Development Goals. In other words, these were high-level uh, goals that we would hope to achieve by the year 2015. Uh, and a broad range of areas related to poverty alleviation, uh, alleviation and human health and, and uh, infant mortality. A lot of these issues, um, you, can see, you can see them listed here, um, have been addressed by countries over the last few years. And um, interestingly enough, none of these issues specifically have energy in their titles or as part of their um, achievement. But I think energy is important for all of the Millennium Development Goals. And as it turns out, um, basically only one of our goals, and that's the, um, the uh, reduction in extreme poverty and hunger, has, um, have we even come close to achieving. And, and it's been reported recently by The Economist that uh, we've halved uh, extreme poverty over the last 20 years. And the reason why I put this up here uh, but we still have many other goals that have not been achieved. But the reason why I put this up here, because I think, feel like energy and especially access to clean energy by all people is really fundamental to achieving goals such as this. And I think the reason why we have seen a lot of reduction in poverty globally is, is because we're able to provide technologies that are giving access to clean energy to more and more people around the world. Um, but the energy access remains a challenge. Um, there are still roughly 1.3 billion people that lack access to any kind of reliable electricity sources. Um, and a good majority of these people, or at least half of these people, are in the South Asia, South Asia region. Uh, in addition, we have 2.6 billion people who are relying on traditional biomass for heating and cooking. And this is a very unsustainable practice that uh, we in the energy, renewable energy business, are hoping to uh, overcome. Um, as you probably know, the UN Secretary General 
uh, about a year and a half ago, a couple of years ago, announced um, the Sustainable Energy for All initiative, which is in a global action to achieve universal access to modern energy services by the year 2030 and to provide half of our energy re uh, services from, for renewable energy. Um, the fact that lower, as, as renewable energy prices are getting lower and lower, the, um, the uh, is allowing more manufacturing and businesses to enter into the market and to diversify into more emerging markets. In other words, um, as the technology prices go down, the uh, the risk of going into uh, higher risk uh, or higher, more difficult markets, such as areas where there's um, very little energy access now, is is going down. And microfinancing mechanisms are becoming available throughout the world to help support this. So, um, as I mentioned, there's a movement, it's called Go 100% Renewables, um, ISIS has, is a founding member of this movement, and basically it's, um, it's an imperative to achieve 100% renewables in our energy supply, and this is all energy, not just electricity, uh, to uh, support climate protection, to ensure energy access for all, and to achieve the Millennium Development Goals, which, by the way, are going to be uh, re visited in, in a couple of years and, and re, rewritten. And I think it, you know, when they do that, I think energy will become a very fundamental part of, the, of those goals. So uh, people may argue that's ridiculous. You can't get to 100% renewables. It's just not going to be physically possible. And perhaps that may be the case. Perhaps we'll get to 99%, but not be able to afford that last percent. But I think that there have been some very good studies done over the past 10 years or so that have provided realistic scenarios of how we get there. These studies are uh, driven by um, goals such as uh, significant renewable energy penetration in the world by the year 2050 or uh, climate protection such as capping uh, the carbon dioxide concentrations to 450 parts per million. And uh, this, this is just a, a list of some of the key studies that have been done recently. Uh, not all of them necessarily go to 100% renewables, but most of them uh, provide pathways to getting to a, a predominantly fossil-free uh, energy system over the next uh, half century or so. Um, there's many issues associated with, with these roadmaps that have to be addressed, uh, such as you know, the, the maturity of our technologies and how do we scale up technology so that they are um, in the commercial marketplace readily. Uh, new R&D breakthroughs to make them more effective. Uh, government policies are going to be very key. Uh, the investment environment in, is um, very important. And of course, this varies very much from country to country and even from region to region. Uh, the access to low-cost capital, uh, the, in other words, the bankability of projects, are they going to be attractive to financiers? Uh, resource availability, that's what we're all uh, talking about here at this meeting. Uh, public acceptance of these technologies and the fact that we're going to have to change the way we use energy over the future. Uh, the, the acceptance by your utility system and the fact that we're going to have to have a transformation in our utility system to accommodate this kind of a future. Um, and supportive infrastructure, global trade relations. You can go on and on. There's a lot of uh, issues that have to be addressed. And then there's a lot of issues that don't necessarily get addressed, addressed as well as they should in a lot of these studies, such as gender empowerment, which is very critical in developing countries, local and community action. We're actually seeing 100% renewables achieved in some cases because of local and community involvement and, and goals. Uh, good urban planning and building design, transportation planning, land use planning, consumption patterns by individuals, uh, the use of materials. We're going to uh, be facing challenges as, as we go forward on, on access to uh, precious metals that, will, that are needed to power many of these technologies and energy efficiency. So I'm going to focus a little bit on PV. That's the area that I've been doing most of my work on over the past 20 years. And uh, we're seeing uh, this is information just published last week by the REN21 Global Status Report. This is an annual report that they produce that uh, provides a pretty comprehensive picture of where we stand with renewable energy uh, growth in the, in the world. Um, we just achieved the um, 100, 100 gigawatt uh, goal, or not goal, but um, uh, marker. Uh, this past year uh, for installed PV capacity around the world. 
Um, and their estimates are that we'll go to perhaps a, around 230 gigawatts by the year 2017, and that CSP, the Concentrating Solar Power Technologies, which are, which are quite a bit far behind PV in terms of installed capacity, will also grow significantly. In fact, 11 gigawatts may be much too conservative. There's a lot of interest in the uh, Middle East and African, Northern African countries and South Africa and some and Spain and the United States to grow concentrating solar power maybe even more than what um, what we're showing here. Um, the IEA produces roadmaps for individual technologies. Uh, their PV roadmap was done several years ago, so this, these numbers may be, be getting out of date now, but they, they saw that we could have 5% global electricity, electricity penetration just by PV alone in the year 2030 and 11 percent by the year 2050. And as I mentioned, uh, the other solar technologies are growing. The uh, uh, solar water heating capacity estimates, and this is only for glaze collectors, is, um, it has ex recently exceeded 255 gigawatts of thermal equivalent. And uh, as I mentioned, concentrating solar power estimates, our, our, our capacity estimates are going up, um, more than doubling over the past two years and expected to double again uh, several times over, over the next uh, 20 years, especially if, if many of these programs in the Middle East and South Africa go forward. Um, much of the PV that's been installed over the last few years is what we call um, central power station configurations. This is where you put uh, large, ground, uh, large arrays of ground-mounted systems uh, greater than a megawatt. Um, back in 2010, it was estimated that over 5,000 ground-mounted one megawatt or larger systems have been installed around the world, and that was about 25% of the capacity back then. I don't have more recent numbers than this, but I think these numbers are continuing to grow. However, it's encouraging to note that rural off-grid development is continuing to grow as well. Um, there is some concern that as the focus on grid-scale grid uh, systems um, became dominant that the uh, the access for rural off-grid development uh, would, would start to diminish, but that doesn't seem to be the case, and that's, that's very important for the um, point I made earlier about the Millennium Development Goals. This is just to kind of give a context of what this means in terms of the global energy supply. Um, our global generating capacity is roughly around a little over 5,000 gigawatts. It, it may be actually uh, quite a bit higher by now, and um, according to the IEA, um, and based on the global status report, 21% uh, now of our electricity supply is coming from renewables. Now, of course, a big part of that is hydro, and that's considered to be a renewable. Even large-scale hydroelectric facilities are, are put in the category of renewable energy. So a lot of that is hydro, but 480 gigawatts, um, about 20% of that number, um, or more than that, actually about 30% uh, of that number, is non-hydro renewables and primarily wind, solar, and then biofuels or, bi or, or biomass um, electricity production. So we can, you can see that the, uh, the role of renewable energy is growing quite a bit in the world, but it's still quite small. Now, getting back to PV, why is it that it's growing so well? Well, I think it's a combination of uh, four or five major factors uh, that all po have positive feedback. Uh, primarily, markets are expanding because of uh, growth in private investment. Growth in private investment is occurring because their manufacturing and scaling up is bringing down the cost of these systems and um, also making uh, financing more readily available. And uh, businesses are coming up, up with more innovative business um, uh, practices and governments are providing, and I think the key point is that governments are providing uh, policies that really encourage the development and deployment of PV. And I think you'll find similar feedback mechanisms uh, with the other technologies as well. I just happen to be focusing on PV here. And uh, one of the ways we look at this is what we call a learning curve. And uh, many of you may have already seen this chart, but roughly um, what we have seen in the, in the area of PV is that um, for every doubling of capacity, uh, the prices decrease 20% for every doubling of capacity. So the, um, so the prices have dropped significantly over the past decade, and it's because over the past decade, we've rough had roughly doubling of capacity almost on a yearly basis. 
And um, government R&D is very important. Uh, this is a, a very busy chart, which I expect all of you to memorize before I turn it off, that um, shows how um, R&D, both in the government supported sector as well as uh, government private um, partnerships have improved the efficiency of, of solar cells over the past uh, uh, 35 years or so uh, su substantially. And of course, some higher efficiency means lower cost and higher uh, return on your investment because of higher energy production. Um, investment flows continue to grow. This is again from the latest global status report, although uh, this past year, uh, I think be, because of the global economy and because of um, some disconnects in supply and demand that, we, that are occurring right now, especially in the P PV sector, uh, the investments have dropped off somewhat. But as you can see, the, the overall trend has been pretty dramatic. Um, it went up from 17% between 2010 and 2011, but as you can see, it dropped about 12% this past year. Um, but still, I think the overall, the, we don't expect this drop to continue. We expect the growth to, to continue as we go forward. And you can see that it's been quite dramatic, except for a couple of years when we've had the global recession or some other issues. Um, certainly from a 100% renewable energy uh, concept, the uh, Resource potential is not a limiting factor. The IPCC put out a report on renewable energy a few years ago, a couple of years ago, and showed that the uh, technical potential for all renewable energy technologies far exceeds what the current demand is for electricity uh, consumption. And um, so I think that that's, that's an important argument to take to your decision makers that uh, we are not resource re limited, although we do have issues with the resource that, as atmospheric scientists, we need to be addressing. And especially in the areas of um, the mesoscale to the synoptic scale, uh, which all, all of you are familiar with, of course, the, uh, this area of, um, uh, you know, from the, well, actually touching upon the micro scale, which is important, especially for wind turbine technology to the to the mesoscale and to the synoptic scale, which is important for uh, large arrays of systems and the weather phenomena that, uh, that impact the variability of these systems. Um, that's, that's a primary area of focus for our work now. And, uh, and by the way, I do want to say that wind and solar are viewed as variable renewable energy uh, systems. And because they are variable, they uh, pose unique challenges to utilities in terms of operating this variability into their grids. And I talked about that quite a bit in the last ICEM, so I won't get into that here because I think we're going to hear some more talks as we go forward in this next three days on this very topic. Uh, just by way of background, there are um, uh, a number of very important international resource assessment programs. There is a SWERA project which uh, took place in uh, starting around 2000 and uh, was supported by the United Nations Environment Program. And it was intended to come up with a way of providing uh, the best quality global solar and wind resource information uh, because resource information was viewed as a barrier to, uh, especially to countries that did not have much of a renewable energy program. So that was an effort by the UN to try to uh, provide information that removed a very critical barrier. Uh, since that time, the uh, program has been shifted over to the International Renewable Energy Agency and it's now being captured under a, a, um, what they call the Global Atlas, and I think you'll be hearing a talk about that uh, during this conference. Um, there's also a program that the World Bank um, is, is supporting called the Solar and Wind, called Solar and Wind Assessments, which will be kind of linked to the Global Atlas, and it, again, it follows a SWERA type of um, activity to help, especially countries that need information the most, to help them with getting a better understanding of where their resources are and how they can access those resources to meet their loads. And then um, I'll just talk briefly here about um, a, the task that uh, was mentioned in the introduction that I'm operating agent for, Task 46. This is a fourth in a series of resource assessment related tasks that the Solar Heating and Cooling Program within the International Energy Agency has supported over the past 20 years or so. And so you can see that um, our current focus has shifted from not just providing mapping, but also to providing 
analytical tools and very important um, information that helps utilities understand how to incorporate variable renewable energy into the grid. And since I'm wearing partly my clean power research hat today, I just wanted to show some quick results here from work that they have been doing and um, showing that, for example, at a single location, a variable renewable energy source such as a PV system or wind turbine is going to show a lot of variability here. This is for a radiance here and the, and the change in the radiance, the ramp rates, which are um, the most concerned to utilities are going to be quite large at a single location. But if you start looking at distributed systems, either uh, solar home systems distributed throughout a community or a number of central power stations, that the ramping does, uh, from the pr perspective of the utility, the ramping is reduced overall. And uh, clean power research is working on, for example, forecasting um, techniques uh, to support organizations like the California Independent Systems Operator, where they're facing the problem of having a lot of um, solar systems installed in households behind the meter. So they don't always know what's going on with these solar systems. And so it's very important for them to have tools available so that they can predict um, as weather changes what well, all of this solar that's out there that's behind the meter and they can't really see, what's it going to be doing under changing weather conditions? And so uh, Clean Power Research is using satellite-based uh, information such as the data that's developed by Dr. Richard Perez here in a, in, in a product called Solar Anywhere, and then they combine this information with um, other analytical tools to help understand and, and be able to forecast better what uh, utilities are going to be experiencing with distributed systems uh, behind the meter. I'll go through this uh, quickly here because I know that uh, I'm running out of time. But uh, so I, what I wanted to do is highlight just quickly some of the work that's being done recently under the IEA task, since that's what I'm most familiar with right now. Uh, currently, we're working in four major areas. One is to uh, look at applications for high penetrations, of, um, including uh, resource variability and combining wind and solar systems. And by the way, I should also mention that several uh, of you are members of Task 46 and will be reporting some results here as, as the week goes on, so I don't want to take away your, your glory, but I do want to just highlight that this is really important work and this is a collaborative, back, collaborative program that of in, in, institutions from around the world are coming together to, to kind of help uh, look and solve, uh, look at problems and solve them uh, from an in, international perspective. Second task is uh, focused around data bankability and um, includes uh, measurements, uh, data filling and gap, gap filling, uh, merging data sets, like merging satellite with ground based data sets, doing uncertainty analysis, uh, a number of, th number of um, issues related to, to data. And then a third task is uh, solar irradiance forecasting, uh, looking at tools such as all sky cameras, cloud motion vectors, uh, numerical weather prediction models. And then finally, there's a task focused on advanced resource modeling, such as better ways of retrieving information from satellites to uh, provide good analytical estimates, and also looking at long term analysis. Um, you know, we now have satellite records that go back to the early 1980s. And so NASA, for example, is working on a program to look at uh, a 30-year cycle of solar resource information to, to get a sense of what the interannual variability and whether there are solar trends or not. Um, so that's very important. So these are just some quick highlights. I don't get into, the, I, like I say, I won't go into a lot of detailed discussion, but uh, for example, here's a study that's being done in southern Spain. I think you might hear more, more about this later. Uh, looking at um, how you can reduce variability by having both wind and solar operating together in your system. And these are analytical studies to see just uh, to how that might um, support or how, how it might be able to help utilities dispatch this power. Um, doing these studies, they've determined that, uh, especially in autumn, uh, you, can, you can reduce variability quite a bit by combining wind and solar systems. Under measurement best practices, and again, the task will focus on getting best practice information out there. Uh, there's a lot of work being done now with the rotating shadow band radiometer, and how um, how can we use that uh, lower cost instrument as a tool for uh, for doing resource assessment? Uh, it's becoming uh, quite widely used, um, and in, but it's important to understand what what its limitations are and what its and what its value is. 
uh, to the industry, especially with DNI, the direct normal insulation. It's a very low cost way of getting uh, direct normal insulation, which is important to the concentrating solar technology. So this is just an example of some of the work that's being done there. Uh, and in terms of solar forecasting, we're looking at combination of cloud motion vectors and numerical weather prediction models and using relative root mean square error, we can see that we can really uh, improve and lower the uncertainty of our forecast by combining cloud motion vectors with numerical weather prediction models, for example. And then just one more, more example, um, part of the work that we're doing in, in the task is looking at circumsolar radiation, which is something that's very important, again, to the concentrating solar power industry because it, it can represent a significant par percentage of, in, of energy that they may not be able to capture be because um, it's not part of the direct solar disk or it may not be accurately measured because it's not part of the direct uh, solar beam. So to close then, the, uh, as I started off with, the, the meteorolo meteorologist societal mandate is of course a very important weather disaster warning and mitigation. I really appreciate the fact that we had um, the, you know, the perspective from the WMO presented on that just before my talk as well. Um, you know, obviously the uh, climate change um, is manifesting itself, we believe, in extreme weather events. I think we've seen a lot of evidence for that. Um, scientists must keep informing decision makers. I mean, I think this is a big challenge we have. Uh, there's skeptics out there, there's, and there's skeptics who are, that are decision makers who don't necessarily want to hear this information or, or appreciate uh, how important it is. So this is a key role for uh, meteorologists to continue to figure out ways to convey um, information to decision makers so, so that they can take action on what, we're, what we are clearly finding out. And um, also to take other steps th through our forecasting methods to reduce the risks associated with these extreme weather events. So that's one area. The other area, another area is health, welfare, and safety. Um, that's been our traditional role and in, in helping out with commerce and you know, aircraft safety, of course, and aircraft operations is a big uh, benefactor of our, of our services. But then as I, as I said, and I, I liked um, Alberto's slide at the beginning that showed the growth of the interest in energy, and in energy meteorology and how our, as meteorologists, we can pay, play a major role in helping communities all around the world obtain access and to energy services, to clean energy services, and improve their local energy security and economy through those services. Um, by reducing, by providing information that reduces risks in the investment and communicating resource potential so that um, even those communities that are not served at all by um, any kind of energy service can understand that the resource is available to them to access it if they can um, come up with the right programs to do that. And um, of course, ultimately to integrate all these technologies together so that we can have a world uh, with a transformed energy infrastructure that allows us to achieve 100% renewable energy. So thank you. I just wanted to highlight that uh, a lot of um, information will be presented at the ISIS Solar World Congress in Cancun. So I invite you all to please attend this Congress in November. Uh, that's my pitch that I have to do as ISIS president. So thank you for allowing me to do that. And thank you for your attention.